Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. We are ready to get started. So I'm going to ask that you minimize your transactions, finish them up. Um, and I want to start with a quote. Never be limited by other people's imagination. These are the words of Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman to become an astronaut. Good afternoon, I'm Duana Brockington, and I welcome you to Black Ink Charleston, a Charleston African-American Book Festival. This is the, thank you. This is the seventh festival in eight years, and I have to say, we just get better as we grow. As always, we have to start off with the business part of things so that we can get to the good part. So please bear with me as I thank the following. I'll start with our planning committee members, Savannah Frierson, Rhonda McKnight, Lisa Van Bergen, Jocelyn Johnson, April Richardson, Nulani Bennett, and the new Poet Laureate for the City of Charleston, Asia May. Our sponsors for today's event, the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture, the Charleston Friends of the Library, the College of Charleston, the Gaylord and Don Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, WCSC Live 5 News, Explore Charleston, Nubian Audio, Amazon, Romance Writers of America, and the Gullah Renaissance, who is also here today. She has a uh, product out in the lobby. Please stop by and uh, check out her amazing um, stuff because she's going to get all my money. To our PR and tech consultants, Amanda Komen and Shanita Kraut, as well as our honorary committee members, Samuel Bellamy Jr. and John Mitchell, a million thank yous. None of this would be possible without the commitment of the people and businesses named, and of course, our understanding family and friends. This takes a lot of time and energy, y'all. The theme for this year's event has been Afrofuturism, or as we've been saying, Black to the future. What is Afrofuturism? It's a philosophy of science and history that explores the intersection of the African diaspora with science and technology. It addresses themes and concerns through technoculture and speculative fiction, encompassing a range of media and artists with a shared interest in envisioning Black futures that stem from an Afrocentric viewpoint. While Afrofuturism is most commonly associated with science fiction, it can also encompass other speculative genres such as fantasy, alternate history, and magical realism. As Stephen Barnes shared in the virtual fireside chat on Thursday, he realized that the Black people he was reading about and seeing in movies and books um, in the future were being erased. And so he decided to change things and write his own future. Never be limited by other people's imagination. Namina Forna, our keynote speaker today, embodies that energy. Namina was born in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and moved to the U.S. at the age of nine. She is an alumna of Spelman College and a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She has been a finalist of the NBC Universal Writers on the Verge program. She's been in the top 50 in the prestigious Nickel Fellowship 
and top 10 in her category at the Austin Fellowship Screenwriting Competition. At Spelman, she nurtured the idea that would become the Gilded Ones. She probed the concepts of femininity she developed in Sierra Leone and at Spelman. There was no denying the patriarchy in Sierra Leone had tried to con and had tried to convince her that she was worthless. And she also realized that the sexism in Georgia <laughs> was just as bad. So when Spellman gifted her with the words and the confidence to understand her experience, Forna knew she had to write a feminist fantasy with a world based in large part on Sierra Leone. Now, Namina writes primarily for television and film, mostly on projects with an Afrofuturistic lens. Publishers Weekly describes her first book, The Gilded Ones, as formidable heroines and a thoughtful feminist mythology Distinguished debut author, Forna's West African inspired fantasy trilogy launched to abun with abundant action that drives the pace while a nuanced plot advocates social change by illustrating the myriad ways in which, the so in which society cages and commodifies women. So y'all, I'm typically, I don't have a problem with my words, but I'm so geeked and excited. It's just hard for me to contain. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna stop speaking and I'm gonna let you hear from Ms. Namina Forney. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here in Charleston. Um, and thank you so much to the Black Ink Book Festival for bringing me in, because I love this place. Um, so before I get started on my keynote, I just wanted to let you all know that this is a little bit interactive, especially in the beginning. So I'm going to ask you all some questions, and I'm going to wait to hear your answer. Are we, are we good with this? Awesome. All right. So when I was growing up, um, in Atlanta, Georgia, in the early 2000s, it wasn't cool to be a black nerd. Some of y'all can remember those times. If you were like, I like superheroes, what did people call you? Anybody remember? Hmm? All right. And if you said, I like fantasy movies, what did people say? Wait, I can't hear you what? Awesome. Worst of all, if you were fascinated with Africa or dare to dream of futuristic black people, what would people call you? <laughs> so <laughs> that's a nice one. What, what I was trying to hear was the word hotep, right? Because back then, everyone was a hotep. If you said anything about Africa, that's what you were. And these were the black people saying this. If you dared to have a vision of black fantasy, black futures, and you try to share this with the gatekeepers in publishing, in film, in television, in art, in basically any field, what happened? Nothing. Because there wasn't a path for you. It just, it wasn't there. But then came 2017. What happened in 2017? Can anybody guess? There was that, yes. Yes, that was the start of it. And because of that, what else happened? So one thing that happened in 2017 that a lot of people don't remember or don't think about um, is the movie Get Out came, right? Everyone always remembers Black Panther, but it was Get Out that changed the game. Why? Because Get Out was truthful. And see, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the truth, your truth. As a writer, as a reader, as a person of this world, the truth of the world that you want to see, the future you want to see, and what it takes to get it. So I'll get back to Get Out. Most people don't realize this, or maybe they do, but the movie is basically sci-fi. I mean, think about it. Wait, wait, okay, wait. Has anyone here uh, not seen the movie or doesn't know the twist? Because, I mean, I don't want to be the one that spoils it for you. I don't want y'all to go home. Hmm? 
Okay, good. Because I don't want y'all to go home saying, oh, now I'm going to ruin the movie. And I was going to watch it, but now I can't, you know, even though it's like six years later, can't watch the movie. All right. But you've all watched it or, you know. All right, good. So in Black, so in Get Out, look at me saying Black Panther. So in Get Out, <laughs> we have a group of white people who are basically implanting their brains into Black people so that they can be younger and more physically fit. This is sci-fi. Sci-fi imagines twists on reality, newer, braver, or even more deranged worlds. And in this case, it imagined a slight twist. But more to the point, it imagined a truth. And for me, that's what stories are, truths, meditations on the world, uh, on how you see the world, the lens through which you view it. And to me, the most uh, successful truths the most successful stories are the ones that you tell as you see it. No holding back, no filter. You just get out there, you say, hey, this is the world as I see it. And that's why Get Out broke the mold. That's why I made money hand over fist in the box office, because it dared to point out a truth that we were not acknowledging in our post-racial world at the time, right? Um, it dared to acknowledge that racism still very much existed and that many of the white liberals who we consider, who considered themselves our allies could perpetuate it. But more to the point, it dared to imagine that even against dire circumstances and, and the stakes in Get Out were dire, black people could prevail. We could win and we could do so with humor. And that's why Every one of us knows Jordan Peele's name. And this is the second point I want to make about creating truths, and in particular, creating truths that imagine a Black future. When you imagine a truth, you can imagine anything you like. It can be dark, it can be funny, it can be fantastical. But since I'm standing up here and um, I was asked to speak to you, I want you all to do one thing for me, right? I want you to imagine Black people winning. I want you to imagine Black people winning gloriously, beautifully, righteously, us winning. See, I'm from Sierra Leone, West Africa, and I know my history. I know that pre-colonial African civilizations, like we had empires, we had castles, we had monuments and astronomers and blacksmiths, Hell, uh, we even had street lights in the 14th century, and this was when most of the world was in darkness. We even had a wall that once upon a time was four times larger than the Great Wall of China. Google the walls of Benin, everyone, if you, if you don't know what that is, Google it. But when I came to America, um, I discovered a funny thing. All this history was flattened and washed away, and all of a sudden, Africa was darkest Africa. And all black history was suddenly pain, it was trauma, um, it was always black people being crushed. But that, of course, was not the whole story. And that, of course, is not the whole truth. I know we're talking about the future here, um, but let me give you all a little history lesson. We're here, you know, in the home of the Gullahs and the Geechees. Um, but did you guys know that Gaulas and Geechees uh, are of Sierra Leonean descent? Y'all knew that? Awesome. See, the people in the low country were taken from West Africa because back then, West Africa was the seat of rice farming. And they were processed through Bunce Island in Sierra Leone. Bunce Island is literally a hop, skip, and a jump away from like where I grew up in Freetown, which is the capital of Sierra Leone. So, it's always interesting for me because the minute I enter the airport here, one of the first things I always see are like the sweet grass baskets. And they always fill me with such emotion because every time I see them, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm coming home. These are my people. You know, like for me as a Sierra Leonean, every time I see it, I am struck by the fact that I'm here among my people. But my people were brought here. They were forced to farm rice in this country so far away from their own, in a place that was 
in many ways inhospitable to farming rice. And do you know what they did? See, I learned um, this amazing fact yesterday from my Morehouse brother, John Tillerson. He's sitting right there. So what he told me is that they, the Gullahs and the Geechees, changed the coastline. They and um, sci-fi nerds, where are y'all? Yes, so y'all will appreciate this. They terraformed the coastline, right? Um, so John explained to me that the coast, as you see it now, isn't as it originally was. The Gullahs and the Geechees changed it so they could mix fresh water with salt water to create the brackish water that was perfect for growing rice. And I find this amazing because in this inhospitable place, all across the world, in an inhospitable time, our people still won. Literally under the eyes of the slave masters, they made this land and this water their own. They made it like home. And when I was walking out yesterday, I went to see the water and I was astonished because it just reminded me of home. Like it could be like I was staring at my backyard back in Sierra Leone. So when you're creating your stories, your truths about black futures and black fantasies, I want you all to remember our past. I want you to remember that in every time and every place, black people have forged forward, and even under the most dire circumstances, they've won. They've made things their own, even when they were told they couldn't. They carved victory out of stone. So what am I saying to you? What I'm saying is that I understand that stories of black trauma are important, but equally as important are stories of black love, of black happiness, of joy. As you create your truths, don't forget the joy. Don't forget the victory. Don't forget that we as a people always forge forward and we always win. No matter the odds, no matter how long it takes, we win. And this leads me to my third and final point, persistence. Writing your truths requires persistence. For this one, I'll go back to the early 2000s. That was when I first came up with the concept of The Gilded Ones, which is the first book in my trilogy about superpowered girls who bleed gold and fight the patriarchy. When I told the people about this book in 2006, do you think they were interested? Nope. Do you think they think it, thought it was cool? Nope. People called me a hotep. And those were the nice ones. <laughs> like. People said that I needed to stop being obsessed with writing fantasies that no one would ever buy and get a real job. Literally, when I pitched the book in 2012, um, an agent from a prominent company said to my face, and I quote, your shit is cool and all, but no one wants to read stuff about black people. That's what he said to my face. It took me 12 years to get an agent. That's hundreds of rejections. And I wasn't just writing books, um, I was writing screenplays too. So I was getting <laughs> rejected on all sides. I, got re I once got rejected by an agent um, on, my way to my, um, on my way to my graduation. Um, and he had already told me that he wanted to sign me. I was literally driving to his office when his assistant called me and told me that I couldn't come anymore. I had to pull off on the side of the highway, cry, then paste on a smile and go to graduation and pretend like everything was okay to my family because I literally just told them that, oh my gosh, I had an agent who was about to offer me representation. Imagine that. And it would have been so easy for me to like pack up um, and give up and go to law school, which by the way, <laughs> I applied to law school three times, got in three times and never went. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I didn't, and you know why? Because I believed in my truths. I believed in my stories. I believed that one day people would, people would want to see stories about black girls in fantasy worlds resisting. I believed that one day people would want to see stories about black people in fantasy worlds, in fantasy scapes, 
beautiful places that reflected a glorious past. So I persisted. And imagine if I hadn't. I wouldn't be here in front of y'all today. I'd probably be somewhere in front of a computer right now, like hunched over a brief, some type of law brief, I don't know, being like absolutely miserable. So to all of you today, and I understand a large number of you are writers, I say persist. Whatever your truth is, if it's stories, if it's art, if it's simply living a soft life, because that's valued and God knows we need it, persist. If you know that there is something that you're meant to be doing, a world that you're meant to build, persist. Don't let small-minded people who cannot imagine the glory that you can tell you that your truths, your stories are not valuable because they are. And we're waiting for you to put them out into this world. So what does building black futures mean? It means finding your truth and honoring it. It also means persisting, even in the face of rejection, doubt, uncertainty. The world may not be ready for your stories right now. It may not be ready for your truths, but one day it will be. And one day we'll all be standing here waiting to hear you to see your stories of black victory and black glory. We'll be waiting to see your stories of black joy and black hope. We'll be waiting for your horror, your sci-fi, your fantasy, your romance, your thriller, your comedy. We'll be waiting for you. Because at the end of it, that's what the black future is. It's you. It's you, the dreamers, the truth tellers, the story weavers. It's you, the people in this room, the people who are watching, the people who are listening. The black future that we're waiting for is you. Thank you. So Namina has been gracious enough to um, open the floor to a Q&A. And so we've got the mic coming. If you have a question, raise your hand and one of us will get the mic to you. Y'all can ask me anything. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is KJ. Uh, excuse me. All right. <laughs> my name is KJ. Um, as a Gullah Geechee person who just recently found out, three goes to Sierra Leone. When I go, what should I be? Uh, what is the thing that we should be seeing when we get to our homeland? Because I'm excited to go and I have no idea about the country at all. So what should we be looking forward to when we when we eventually visit? I mean, being a glutton myself, the first thing I would say is eat. Amen. Like, I mean, I mean, like, I there's stuff to do in Sierra Leone, sure, but eat first because, like, one thing I will say about my country is that every meal that you eat is going to be delicious. So eat first. Um, I will then say that the other things that you should do is go to Bons Island. Go to Bons Island. Like, unfortunately. You know, Sierra Leone, we had a civil war um, from, we had a civil war from 1992 to 2002. So we're still rebuilding um, and our infrastructure is not that great. But when you go to Bons Island, you can literally walk through those ruins and you can feel as our ancestors felt. It's there, the history is there. It's all there, you can go. The other thing I will say is because yes, there's that history, Go to the beaches. We have beautiful beaches in Sierra Leone. We have this river called Number Two River, which is, um, well, it's actually a beach. It's unfortunately named. <clears throat> but it's named that way because it's like uh, two rivers cross over and meet the ocean. And it's one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. In fact, like there was a bounty, you know, the chocolate um, commercial way back in the day that like said, you know, 
bounty is paradise or something like that, and they use number two of her as you know the depiction of paradise. So I would go there. There's also like go to the cap like go to the capital city, Freetown. It still has a lot um, of that colonial architecture. There's just like there's the market here. There's a big market in um, in Freetown where you can go and sort of get like all your masks and all like all. It's very interesting. All the same um, stuff. Some of like the same sort of sweet grass stuff that you can get here, you can get there. Um, the other thing that I would say is there's a, a documentary. It's called The Language We Cry In. Um, and it focuses on, um, I believe, some Gala returnees going back to the village of their origin. And I would just watch that before you go just to sort of situ situate yourself in like Sierra Leone. Good afternoon. I'm Tiffany Blacknell Benjamin. Thank you so much for your vulnerable words today. Um, you mentioned that it took 12 years to get representation. Um, the book that you finally received representation on, was it the same after the 12 years? Um, did you make a lot of changes to it? Um, was it an entirely a new project from when you started the journey um, coming out of school? So The Gilded Ones is a book that took years, right? Because um, I originally thought, first thought of the idea in about like 2006. Um, so I used to have this recurring dream and it was this girl in golden armor and she's walking slow motion on the battlefield. Um, and at the time I was taking women's studies classes and I was like, wait a second, you know, patriarchy is a system. I, I hadn't realized that, but once I put a word to it, I was like, I wanna explain this to everybody. I was like, let me write a book that explains this and we're gonna put this girl in there, you know, and we're gonna make it. And so, but like the time that I actually sat down to writing the book was 2012. And I sent it out in 2012 and it got back, it got back bites, but those bites sort of went like this. Really cool, really, really cool concept. Um, Does the main character have to be, um, Black, those were the bites that I got back from agents. So I realized that the time was not right for the book. So I put it aside and I worked on other things. And in fact, like the agent that I got, um, I got them off of another book that I'd worked on. So the Gilded Ones wasn't the book that, because I know, like, I know this is like the myth that like, oh my gosh, you, you know, you get a, you get an agent off of your first book. And like, most people are like uh, writers, the first book they ever write, that's the one that gets published? No, usually not. Usually you've, you know, you've, you've written three, four books, put them in the corner, and then the fifth one, that's what sort of gets through. So um, I had another book, um, sent it out. Um, it got bites uh, from publishers, but like, anyway, racism in that time was a very interesting thing. We're not gonna get into that story, um, but so, <laughs> So I was just like, I don't know what to do. I was working at a very horrible job and I was like, I can't take this anymore. Like maybe I really do need to actually go to law school now. Um, but then I saw like uh, the, I saw the reception that Black Panther was getting, right? Um, the, no, the reception that like the promos for Black Panther was getting at the time I was working as a clickbait writer. And it was like my job to like find trends. And so when I saw what, you know, what was happening with Black Panther I was like, oh, this movie is going to be huge. So um, I think now the time is right to sell The Gilded Ones. So I tell my agent about it and I was just like, hey, Alice, I have this idea. It's a book. It's about black girls fighting the patriarchy. They bleed gold. She's like, bet. I'm like, bet. She's like, this is amazing. Do it. I was like, all right, cool. I wrote that. I, I tossed away what I had and I rewrote that book in a month and a half. I will never recommend this to anybody. <laughs> um, let me let, let me be 100% with y'all right now. Like, cause I know when people hear that, they're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I need, what I need y'all to hear is that was desperation. Cause like, um, basically my job had told us that like they were uh, going to lay us all off and then hire us back as freelancers, right? Really messed up. Hmm. So I was just like, I can't take this anymore. I'm staring at the barrel end of poverty and I've already been poor for like a long time. Cause like, you know, like I went to film school and when you graduate from film school, unless you're one of those, you know, you tend to be poor. And I was tired of poverty. 
Um, and I was tired of the struggle. So I was like, this is my last chance. It's either this or I go to law school and I get like a stable job because I literally cannot do this anymore. So I would wake up um, like 4, 5 a.m., write like 10, 20 pages before work. And this is the thing that like screenwriting gets you. It gets you that not have, being precious, but precious about your work and writing really fast. That's what happens. But also, again, this was desperation. Like this was desperation writing. This was, this was do or die writing. So I, I, I really need y'all to hear that and not do what I did unless you're staring down the barrel end of like poverty and you already have an agent, don't do it because that's just not good for your mental health. So um, anyway, rewrote it from scratch in a month and a half because I realized that the times had changed. Like in 2012, like it wasn't cool to be, it wasn't cool to be a feminist. You couldn't say the word black. Like, you know, it was just, it was a different time. But now, like, I was like, I can go hard on this book and I can write it the way that I truly want to. So I did that rewrite and we sent it out and in, like a day we got a bite. Um, and it was preempted that day. Um, and that was how I sold the book. But again, don't listen to, oh, I wrote it in this and <laughs> listen to desperation and stuff like that will mess up your body. So don't do it. <laughs> yeah. So that's. How I, did I answer the question? I lost track of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so this is a book question. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the second book with Decca and realizing, not trying to spoil it, exactly what happened with mm -hmm. the mothers, if you can, how is that going to affect her in book three? See, this is why I can't with you. Why are you here? Um, hey, <laughs> she's an angrier person, that's for sure. She's very angry. Um, she's also desperate because, it, you know, you recall what happened to her at the end of the book, like what happened to the arms travels and, you know, so she's not the Deka that we saw before. This is a new Deka. This is a very angry and frustrated and desperate Deka, even more desperate than we've seen her before. And this is a Deka who will do anything to survive because right now it is survival. That's as, that's as far as I can tell you. Why are you here? <laughs> uh, you think, all right, cool. We kiki afterwards. Hi, my name is Ryan Jenkins. And first of all, you're brilliant. Um, I just got into fancy maybe a year ago and came across your book. Number one, I'm at, I knew you but didn't know you, but I was wondering if you could expand on the concept of how they were taking the blood, the golden blood, and mm -hmm. was selling it. And I, I read in one of your interviews your parallel, but I was wondering if you can expand on that. Like, what was the purpose of them doing that to the characters? Awesome. See, I had to take off my shoes. That's why I'm shorter, in case y'all were wondering. Like, you know, these shoes, they're nice for like a little bit, but then you got to, yeah. All right. Um, so one of the uh, things that I learned uh, in my feminist theory classes was, hmm, how to say this. Um, what is the specific word? I'm blanking on the specific word. Um, Dang it, why can't I remember the word? See, this is what happens when you're tired and jet lagged. But like basically what it is, is that women, ah, commodification, there we go. I had to like trail it to get to it. Um, so what does commodification mean? Commodification means that women are seen as commodities. We are seen as things to be bought and sold. You know, that's why there's the youth economy of, oh, you know, you gotta be young, find a husband, da, 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 right? Because you trade, that. that's your value. Women there's a monetary value attached to women. And so when I was uh, thinking of how to tell a story that explains what it means um, for a woman to be born into a patriarchal society and to live in it, I had to find a visual metaphor that explains it very explicitly. So like the minute you see it, you get what I'm trying to say. And that's why the girls bleed gold, right? Because, and I actually, like, I actually don't think the Gilded Ones is far from the realm of humanity in that if women could bleed gold, guess what? <laughs> what would happen? 
we be bought and sold even more like um, explicitly. People will be bleeding us day in and day out. Like it happens in different ways already, but that's like the visual metaphor. Um, and that's like the direct thing to the gut. And that's why I use that, right? Um, because sometimes in stories, necessity creates a story, um, a story, a part of the story. And that's what it was. I was like, how do I explain this? And I was like, ah, gold. I, I hadn't originally thought that they should bleed gold, but like when I was like, how do I explain what I'm trying to say? That's how it came about. So I have a question about uh, being a feminist mm -hmm. and reconciling because uh, feminism isn't necessarily, while it's something that black women have done, we haven't always put a label on it. So how did you get to the point where you were ready to call yourself a feminist and stand proudly in that? I think I came out the womb a feminist, right? Cause like I looked around, like, see, I was one of those skeptical kids. I was like one of those kids who like, you know, everyone's like, ah, oh, here she comes to like, just ruin the thing. Because I'd look around like, you know, that kid who's like looking around with a vague sort of aura of disgust at everything that they're seeing. That was me. I look around and be like, this is the ghetto. Like, because like I would see things, I'd be like, but why? Why though? Why? Right? And like the minute that I discovered there was a word for it, I was like, oh, that's what I am. I'm a feminist because I believe um, in equality. I believe that you know, we don't all have the same abilities, but everybody should have an equal shot at everything, right? And when we talk about feminism, like, I, I, I feel like more specifically, um, I'm a womanist in that, you know, hmm. see, this is why I don't like semantics. And I, like, I think the, the problem is that there's all these words and all this splitting of the words and it makes everything difficult. Um, I think for me, in terms of how I see the world, um, I tend to see the world as we all have our struggles in this life, right? We all do. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. The human condition is struggle. But the insidious thing about this world is that um, we, live in a patri we live in patriarchal societies, and uh, there are very, actually very few people who aggressively benefit from the patriarchy. And when I was uh, thinking about the gilded ones and also thinking about the merciless ones, like initially I was like, okay, let's talk about like, how does the patriarchy affect women, right? But the more that I, and, and women and femmes, let's put it that way, if you are female presenting. But the more that I started thinking about it and the more that I looked around, I realized, oh, wait a second, we're all suffering under this, right? Like all of us have something to lose under this. It's not just women, it's not just fans, it's men too, you know. Um, it's people who consider themselves the third gender. It's just everyone has something to lose except for a small and rare few, right? Because like really when you, you go sort of like to the depths of it, then there's like it's a small group of very powerful, very rich men who actually benefit from everything and then everybody else sort of falls under. And so... I guess this is a circuitous way to say that um, I use the term feminist because it's the most easily understandable term. But I think that um, in this time, like there's many different nuances in feminism. There's white feminism, there's um, womanism, there's this, that, and the other. And for me, just boils down to, I'm a short person, right? I'm a very short person. I'll never play in the NBA. I don't want to play in the NBA, right? Like I, like, I don't even know what happens in basketball. Let's be real. But I would like my chance to try out. I would like my chance to shoot my shot. I think in this world, everyone should have just the basic chance to shoot their shot. And that is sort of like my way of looking at things. Hi. 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 Um, so my question was, I wrote it down, so I don't forget. Um, but my question was, how do you merge your African heritage and culture within your writing while still being unique to your own voice? 
Oh, see, I, I like this question because this is a world building question and I love world building. So I think as writers, um, one of the biggest jobs as writers is that basically we take different things from different places and we synthesize them, right? And that means doing your research. When I sat down to write The Gilded Ones, like, I mean, my dad was an amateur historian. I like, I grew up with all these books about African history, but like when it was time to write this book, I went back and I read about African history. I read about feminism. I like, I read and read and read all these things until I read enough that I could forget, right? Because that's what it takes to build worlds. That's what it takes to um, incorporate a history and a culture. You have to understand it enough that at some point you like you forget because it's like it's like if the knowledge is fresh here it's down here now it's like that deep seated in you right so when i'm incorporating african culture in my world like i'm incorporating not only stuff that i learned growing up in sierra leone and stuff that's sort of intrinsic to me i'm incorporating a lot of the research that i did which might not be um sort of like immediately apparent but it's there for instance if you guys read the book, um, there are uh, like Himaira, the capital city, has these walls, you know, these towering walls, the walls of Himaira. But where does that come from, right? One of the things that I'm fascinated by and I'm sort of mad about is that um, in, uh, in Benin, in what is now Nigeria, um, there were once these walls that were like um, sort of like the greatest earthworks ever built in the pre mechanical age. They were once four times the size of the Great Wall or length of the Great Wall of China. They could circle the, the entire island of the UK about 16 times. You know, they, they were massive, massive walls. They were, a, they were a feat of wonder that even, you know, like when Europeans came to visit, like way back, yay, they, like, they looked and they marveled at this city that was like so well built and these walls that were amazing. Like this place had street lights, right? Why don't we know about Benin? Have y'all ever heard, like, unless you watched Big Mouth, you've probably never heard about this, right? And if you go to Benin, Nigeria now, like, you might see a piece of rubble or two, but the walls aren't there anymore. Um, and that's because in the 18th century, the British uh, went to Benin and they burned the city to the ground um, and they stole like, and you might, you guys have, might have heard of the Benin bronzes. They were some of like the greatest earthwork, uh, sorry, artworks of, you know, antiquity. They, they stole the bronzes, took them to England. And so basically wiped out that history. And this is, um, and so when I was writing this book, I wanted to talk about the walls of Benin. Um, and so I, you know, repurposed them and made them the walls of Himaira. And that's the research. And that's like in any book, when you're writing, the research must be invisible. So it's there. So hope that answers. Yeah. Yes. Is there a reason that you went for traditional publishing as opposed to self-publishing? Oh, yeah. Because I'm lazy. <laughs> I mean, let, let's be real. Like... I, I am a very lazy person. I like to be in my PJs all day. I don't like leaving my house. I do not. I don't even like leaving my bed. I don't have the hustle. You know how people are like, I have this and I have a side gig. I do not have hustle. I do not. I do not have hustle. I do not have that hustle that it takes. See, this is why like, I am amazed um, by self-published writers because like, you know, they write their books, they edit or they find editors or they create little collectives, they market their books, they talk to booksellers, they do this, they do that. Like, I don't have that energy. Like, I have barely enough energy to get out of bed and like walk my dog. And I do that in my PJs. So no, that's why I chose traditional publishing because I knew if I self-published, I would fail because I do not have that hustle. Also, I wanted advances. But I mean, you know, money's nice. And for somebody who didn't have it for a long time, it's very nice. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My question to you is about the law aspect. You, you Several times in, when you were talking, you said something about mm -hmm. going back and do the, the law. Mm -hmm. have, do you find yourself having to use the information that you gathered 
three years with law in your business now as an author? See, I never went to law school. I, I, know, you didn't, yeah. I know you said you didn't go, mm -hmm. but you know, the study that you was thinking about, thinking about actually going, did mm -hmm. you have a, it, you had to have some type of passion for law too? Oh, no, I did not. I did not did at not. all. Like, what I are you talking? I am like, okay, so here, oh. let, let, let me let me yeah. clear some misconceptions you know, you right about here. The graduation, that's when I was. Oh going. no no! So I went to a film school. I, I was I was I was a great disappointment. Like, like, oh. Okay, so let me be like, so I'm African, right? I'm West African. I am Sierra Leonean. Like, for West African people, you will notice we, there are three careers. Who's African? What are the th what are the three careers? Tell me. Exactly, exactly, eh, exactly. Yeah. And imagine when I said to my parents, I want to go to film school. <laughs> like, like, oh my gosh, it was like World War VIII. You should have seen like the, the drama, but it, it was awful. She was valedictorian. She went to school on a full ride and now she wants to go to film school. Ah, like, my family was mad for years. It was so bad. And so like, so here's the thing, like, okay, actually think like, thank you for that question because this is a good chance to talk about privilege, right? Um, because, so what does it take to be a writer? And I always like to say this because publishing, hmm, it, is an, it is an interesting industry um, and it's a difficult industry, right? And if you don't have some level of support, it's very hard to get into publishing. You have to be aware of your privileges. My family did not support me being a writer. They thought like literally people would be like, <laughs> what are you doing? Look at you, like uselessness. You should have been a lawyer by now. You should have been making six figures and now look at you, right? But my family, thank God, being West African, we're never gonna let me starve. The shame of it would be too much. So that was my privilege, was that no matter how much I failed, I could always go home, right? Now, it would be to go home to go to law school. I would have to take the LSAT again and pass and get into law school. But like, I could always reset, like whenever I got like too poor, too depressed or whatever, I could reset, go to my sister's basement, stay there for a couple of months until I got my win back and then be like, psych, peace, I'm going back to LA, I'm gonna see y'all. And that's what I did continuously um, until finally, you know, stuff finally cracked for me. But like the, the law was not helpful. I will say though, um, I used to work um, for the Writers Guild and that was helpful because I looked at contracts day in, day out. So I knew what a good contract looked like. Right. So that was helpful seeing the contracts, but I didn't really have law knowledge. I just, I was just like faking it. <laughs> I was just psyching them out. I was like, take care of me. And then, yeah. So privilege, like when you are thinking about, like when you're writing, consider what are the privileges that can allow you to continue the dream, right? Like, and that's a serious thing. What do you have that can allow you to continue the dream? Because a lot of times it's so hard and it's, it's frustrating and like, it's depressing. Like I will tell you like all the time that I was like trying to be a writer, I was depressed and anxious all the time. Oh my God. Like my head was just boop, 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 all the time. So consider what are the privilege that, privileges that you have that can help you go the way. Hi, how you doing? Hi, hi. Thank you so much for speaking and the encouraging words. Speaking with you last night, I didn't know who I was speaking to. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we did speak about, you said most lawyers were writers. Now I understood why you say why you saw that, um, said that. But when you came, um, I was that child like you, looking at everyone and it was like, she's bougie, she's stuck up. And it was never that, it was just, my outlook was always different. Being that you had that outlook in Sierra Leone, when you came to the States, was it still the same outlook when you started to interact with people on the same ages and definitely female? Oh yeah, I got worse, <laughs> right? Because like, honestly, like I feel like um, I have always on some level been like, this is BS. 
that's BS. This is BS. Like, you know, like I was a very polite kid, make no mistake, but you could see it in my eyes that I was like, this is BS. Um, Cause I think like I've always, and I think this is just in general as writers, I'm sure that all of you like on some level um, agree with this. Like part of what makes a writer is that we tend to be analytical people and we tend to be people watchers. And because we're analytical and we're people watchers, we see the inconsistencies, right? So like all the time, our mind is just going, boo, 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 that's BS, boo, 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 that's BS. Why is that person doing that? What's happening here? Hmm, this is strange. Oh, I think they're sleeping together. Like, you know, <laughs> so like, it's like, it's always the mind um, is, is always working. So like when I came to the United States, like I'll be honest with y'all, like when I came to America, like I, hmm, I was purely bamboozled when I came to America because like I thought I was coming for the summer, right? Because like, um, I was from Freetown, Sierra Leone, very, like, I know people are like Africa, is, da, 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 but like back, back in the day, Freetown was very cosmopolitan. And um, I used to go to like England for the summers to go visit family, right? So like when I came to America, I thought like I was just here for the summer. And it was only when my mother started signing me up for school then I, that I realized, I was like, oh, I have to be bamboozled. And I was pissed because I didn't like Georgia. I was just like, this place is the ghetto. Like, I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, why am I here? Like, the houses are not the best. Like, the grass is brown. What is happening? Why am I here? I was, I was just not a fan. And then I saw purity culture in Georgia. Like, you know, like, and this is the fun, this is the thing that I found interesting. I'm like, how's there a strip club and a church on every corner? How Make it make sense. <laughs> I was like, make it make sense. Like, I was like, so you mean to tell me you go to this and then you go to church? So like the inconsistencies, I was like, some two and two is, is, is five? Like, I just, I couldn't understand. So it was all these things that I was looking at and just getting like absolutely disgusted by. Y'all know that picture of Blue Ivy where she's just like, mm. that was just me all the time, right? And that's why I became a writer. Because I was just like, I am disgusted, but we gonna talk about it. So yeah, that's what makes a writer. Constant disgust. <laughs> She's my new best friend. <laughs> and on behalf of the Black Ink Planning Committee, this is just a small token of our appreciation for you being here today and sharing your gifts with us. And we just have a small gift that is representative of our culture here in Charleston that you have connected with, and we hope you love everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Before we uh, resume with uh, you guys engaging with our authors, just want to let you know that uh, Namina's books are available for sale um, by Turning Point. Um, turning Page, sorry. <laughs> Don't kill me, Valinda. Turning Page, they're out um, visibly. You can uh, check them out. She will also be available for book signings. So get your books come get them signed. We will have her briefly and then we have to release her because she's tired of us. <laughs> but we, we love her. <laughs>